Welcome everyone to this uh, Heptian, Heptian seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Adam Dewis from Perimeter. Uh, and today he's going to talk about classical simulations of quantum field theory in curved space times. So Adam, thanks for giving the seminar and please uh, take it away. Hi, I'm Adam. Uh, so indeed, I'm going to be talking to you today about some work I've been doing in collaboration with Keith Ray Vidal on um, while well, setting up for tensor network simulations of quantum fields on curved backgrounds. Uh, the title is a bit of a mouthful, fermionic Harkin-Hartle vacua from a staggered lattice scheme. This refers to the fact that we're going to be simulating a theory of Dirac fermions. This makes it easier to map to a spin chain, as we'll see. And the quantum state we'll be studying happens to be called the Harkin-Hartle vacuum. It models uh, an event, of, not an event horizon, a horizon in equilibrium with a quantum field. And the discretization technique we'll be using is, happens to be called staggered fermions. So stay tuned. This will all make sense. My background is in numerical relativity, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. On the right here, you see the now obligatory picture of binary black hole merger and in spiral that accompanies any mention of numerical relativity. I'm proud to say that this was generated by my PhD supervisor, Harl Pfeiffer. And how this works, in contrast with analytic relativity, it's an analytic relativity, one has the four dimensional Einstein equations, these guys here, and one solves them analytically by imposing some sort of symmetry. It's like, for example, spherical symmetry to get the Schwarzschild solution. Uh, some time ago, it became increasingly important to get very detailed simulations of binary black hole merger and in spiral so that we could get their gravitational wave signals and compare them with data from gravitational wave detectors. This started to motivate methods of solving the Einstein equations in situations where there was no symmetry and also in enough precision that a perturbative approach wouldn't be appropriate. Um, the major solution here is numerical relativity. In this approach, the Einstein equations are numerically solved by imposing initial and boundary conditions. The stable simulations were first achieved in 2004 and astrophysically realistic simulations within a certain parameter range anyway are now routine. And while I was working on this, I thought that quantum, or at least quantum flavored gravity, might similarly benefit. You can imagine a lot of problems where a way of doing quick, or at least you know, relatively quick, real-time solution simulations might be useful. Suppose I, you hand me some inflationary model, like of a field and of a gravitational back reaction, and then I give you back the power spectrum you get after things bubble and settle and so forth. You might also imagine doing studies of black hole evaporation, and again, different models, you could isolate where semi-classical gravity fails and you could compare different page curves with different models and fields. This, 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 this seems like something potentially useful. Um, so what if these could be easily studied directly as non-perturbative initial value problems, sort of the same way that we do like wind tunnel simulations in, uh, with classical fluid dynamics. Then one could explore parameter spaces form a different quantum gravity models, different initial conditions. I claim that this would be kind of neat. So, with that as our goal, let's step back a little bit and talk about how numerical relativity sort of works. Um, and also I'll start by briefly introducing an initial value picture of space-time. So we've got our space-time geometry here, which I've circled in green. And what we want to do is map into a picture of space moving through time. So we impose some kind of global time coordinate. This is just a name that we're going to give all, the sl all these slices that we've drawn. Each one of them has a spatial metric. And that spatial metric is now going to evolve as a gauge theory forward through time. So we get, we'll, we'll get, when we impose the Einstein equations, an initial value problem for them. So we start by imposing gravitational data, which has now been divided into a spatial metric and roughly its derivative. And also we have matter fields projected onto the surface. And what we want is the same things, but at future values of, of, of our favorite time coordinates. So in this way, you can view, at least in certain space times, general relativity as an initial value problem. And this lets you simulate it with a computer. So if you're given initial data on some slice, you can send it to a big supercomputer. And then you can wait a couple months. And then you'll get back data on future slices. And then you can make neat movies like the one I showed in the first slide. We'd like to make neat movies for quantum gravity, too. So you can imagine doing, as a first step, numerical quantum fields in curved space time. So in this, in this approach, you'd be given um, geometric data over the whole manifold, as well as a quantum state on some initial surface. And then you'd write down some Hamiltonian that moves from slice to slice, and the field would be propagated by that Hamiltonian to future slices, basically by the Schrodinger equation. 
If you could do that, the next step would be to do something like semi-classical gravity. Now you're given only the field and the geometry on a first slice. The field tells you a stress energy tensor expectation value that goes up into uh, classical evolution equations for the fields, uh, for, for the geometry and quantum ones for the state. And like so, the computer now tells you the answer for both the state and the geometry. And then finally, you could imagine exploring other things. I mean, of course, semi-classical gravity is wrong, but you could imagine this exploring theories besides it. The general form of this would be, you start with a state and some geometry data, it goes into your favorite black box, and then it spits out beta in the future. And in this way, you could compare different models of low energy um, gravitation. So in this talk, I'll describe our mewling first efforts towards this goal. We're gonna do lattice simulations of a Dirac field on a fixed one plus one mention metric. We're gonna take just for convenience the metric to have this form of a conformal coordinate. We can always impose this in one plus one. We don't appeal to this directly, but we do use it to simplify our equations. Um, and the goal of this talk will be to look for good initial conditions for future back reaction studies. It's a bit analogous to how we do numerical relativity. One starts by solving a pair of elliptic equations to get an initial state for your favorite manifold. And then the next step, which is somewhat separate um, practically, is to evolve these forward through time. So we're handling the first part here, how we get initial conditions. So we have some slice, which we'll define by a particular omega uh, conformal function at a particular time. And we're gonna approach the quantum problem by relating a set of lattice theories to a theory in the continuum. So we need to map between the two. So we'll have some continuum Hamiltonian and we'll map it to a lattice Hamiltonian via the somewhat standard approach now in the tensor network field called staggered Fermion discretization, which will be adapted slightly for the curved spacetime case. We're gonna map states to states by basically comparing spectra of those Hamiltonians. And it'll be a little more complicated, but we'll also map quadratic expectation values on the lattice to renormalize quadratic expectation values in the continuum. Quadratic here means that there are pairs of fields occurring in the expectation value. And these aren't defined directly in the continuum theory. You need to impose some kind of renormalization scheme. So there's kind of two aims to this. One is we need a renormalization scheme to compare to, and the other is we need to um, get the answer we would have gotten that from the lattice theory. So we'll, we'll show how to do that. And to validate these identifications, we're going to produce results in the so-called hawking hartle vacuum that describes a horizon and thermal equilibrium. And the kind of gold standard feature of this state is that you have some kind of space time and there's a horizon, and then you've got data, oh, you've got data, and it's smooth, and it's even smooth across the horizon, which will not normally be true. So if you prepare just a naive state, it's usually going to diverge on the horizon if you start with a metric that, that, that is only defined in one patch. But we'll show that if you make the right identifications and prepare a state at the right temperature, that you can get a state that's smooth across it, which is the result that you'd expect from QFT curve spacetime. And we'll show that we can do this in Minkowski spacetime and Rindler coordinates. You can view this, if you like, as a validation of the Unruh effect or a recovery of the Unruh effect. And we'll do it in um, a Schwarzschild-like spacetime in one plus one and we'll do it in the sitter space time. So now I'll move on to how we're forming the continuum problem, but first I'd like to take a quick break for questions. So are there any? I'll pull a quick Marco Rubio here while you think about that. Can we... Oh, there's one. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, so you assumed the Schrodinger time evolution? Is that already some... Uh, constraint uh, and not something like in the quantized theory where maybe, uh, I don't know, a wheel of the equation also would be the underlying uh, equation. <laughs> I'm advancing through the slides. Sorry. So your question is that why are we using a Schrodinger equation, not some kind of nonlinear equation, I guess, suppose? Yes. Right. Well, fortunately, in this talk, we're not actually dealing with real-time evolution directly. So it's, this, this question doesn't quite arise yet. But I guess the idea is that not so much using the Schrodinger equation directly as taking an operator that propagates from surfaces to surfaces, which might not be the traditional Hamiltonian. I haven't looked into this directly. It might be necessary in the real time problem to add nonlinear terms to deal with the problem you're describing. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Is that everything? I'm sorry, I just did crazy stuff with the slides there. I forgot which button goes forward and which one goes backward. Yeah, uh, all good here, so yes.
Okay, very good. So we'll start by formulating the continuum problem. So we have a free Dirac field. Um, the Dirac field is called psi, and it's a function of space time because this is a curved manifold. I guess it would be any shape, but it'd be a somewhat trivial function. And um, formally, we write this as a vector with two components. It doesn't transform like a vector, but it behaves like one in most of the operations that you don't use it for, provided the coordinates be held fixed, of course. Uh, and it'll obey the free Dirac Lagrangian, which I've written here. And it's just the familiar one with some adjustments made for curved space time. Why are we studying a Dirac field and not like a free scalar? It's kind of like a rule that one normally uses a free scalar field when they do Q of T in curved space time. Well, that makes things easier with the analytic calculation, but it's a bit harder from the numerical perspective. First, the free boson C of T has an infrared divergence, which we'd rather not think about right now. And second, it's, more, it's easier to take a theory of fermions and map it onto a spin chain. And spin chains are kind of what you really want to be handling, if you can, with MPS. So it's just more, it's, it's a little more work from the analytics side, but at the end, you get an easier numerical problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. So we have some stress energy tensor. The one for the free Dirac field happens to be this. And the lead transport of the field, I mean the classical field, along some vector psi. So here's a picture of that vector. Um, lead transport from one slice to another of the field is given by its stress energy tensor contracted with the vector you want to go in the direction of and uh, a volume element on an area element on the hypersurface. So this operator is the generator of infinitesimal transformation between surface to surface of the field with stress energy tensor T. So if we fix um, some psi and we fix our metric to look like this and we fix our psi to advance forward in time, this specializes to the operator I'm going to call the Hamiltonian, which happens to be this thing here. Now we'd like to compute quadratic observables. Why do we want to compute quadratic observables? Well, first, what's a quadratic observable? It means that pairs like psi bar psi appear in the operator. And the reason we want to compute them is because the stress energy tensor is one of them. And later on, we'd like to do back reaction studies, which presumably will need some way of estimating the stress energy tensor. That's at least what we would have to do if we want to do like 1980-style quantum semi-classical gravity. In the classical theory, one could just compute this. I give you some classical fields, and it's just a thing I can, you know, I know how to multiply. But when psi is a quantum operator, uh, pairs of fields like this are formally infinite. So this doesn't actually make any sense naively. We need to do something extra to, to, get, to, get, a, to get a finite answer. And this brings us to the storied topic of renormalization in curved space time. So as I said, quadratic expectations like psi bar psi are formally divergent, even in the free theory. In free Minkowski theory, one, what one does is expand into creation annihilation operators and then just sort of demand by fiat that they only appear in a certain order. And if you do this, the divergent bit goes away, and now you get a finite answer, which is usually zero if you did everything a normal way. But this selects a preferred time because of the connection between normal ordering and uh, time ordering. But we don't really want to do that enough in a curve space time. In addition, there's the kind of thornier choice of why you chose, say, the energy to be zero and not like three. And this becomes more problematic in a theory where the absolute value of the energy couples to gravity. Um, in fact, many flat space-time renormalization procedures, even the more sophisticated ones we use when interactions are introduced, fail similarly in curved space-time. Either they fail or they just become very cumbersome because they rely usually on some kind of Fourier-like transformation and the symmetries that make that useful don't apply anymore. So it's usually better to work directly in coordinate space. Actually, a similar problem occurs in numerical quantum field theory, especially in these tensor network lattice studies. Um, the divergent terms in numerical data aren't so easily isolated. So what one typically does is they get a bunch of lattices, and then they plot the lattice spacing, and then they take their favorite operator, and they'll get some kind of term, and it will usually blow up as the lattice spacing goes to zero. So of course you have to subtract something from this to get a finite answer. And what, one, what, what people typically do is they write down some kind of semi-empirical ansatz, and then they fit it to the divergent data, and they subtract, and they get a finite number. And that's perfectly fine for what they're doing. But in curved space time, it, there are actually finite terms you need to keep track of. So it's important that you subtract to get zero, for example, it'll be a function, and not three or two or five. It, it's not just that it's finite, and it's not enough to just compare different operators. You need to get the right answer. Um, so you need a more principal way of doing this. Otherwise, you won't get all our favorite CFT results, like the trace anomaly and so forth. And this is how we introduce Hadamard renormalization, or as I like to call it, Hadamard renormalization. And this takes the step, it's, it's well, like any other renormalization procedure, 
The first step is to replace your divergent quadratic expectation values with some sort of defined regulated thing. And in this case, what it is, is uh, a correlation function that, that's separated by a, by a small extent. And it's not just separated, it's separated along a geodesic. And that's why it's covariant point splitting and not just plain old point splitting. Uh, and then you find that these limits have divergent terms and there's a means of calculating them due to Hadamard. And you subtract those and then you're off to the races. That's the basic plan. Okay, so let's start by describing point splitting regularization. So here on the left, we've got our quadratic operator and I say it's quadratic because the T and the X are the same at both points. It's convenient for us to fix T at both points. To, I'm sorry, to hold T constant uh, when we do the point splitting because that's what's gonna happen to the lattice data but normally one would not. So I've still got T on the right hand side constant but now I've introduced a field point. That's the field point. And then a base point here. So there's the separated part and here's the original part. And we're gonna take the limit along the unique geodesic that connects these two points. And that's how we'll define a finite operator because whenever X prime and X are not white light separated, sort of by assumption, this will be a defined number. If it's not a defined number, something went wrong. So, well, this formalism won't help you. Right, so we're separating the quadratic observable into a finite bit. That's finite because X prime doesn't equal X and a divergent bit that blows up as we approach um, X prime at X. So we're gonna subtract the divergent piece from the finite one. I lied to you actually, we're not subtracting just the divergent piece. We're subtracting the whole part of the function that's determined purely by the geometry. So everything in the problem that only came from the metric, we're gonna subtract off here. And that might include some finite pieces which do have to be dealt with. And the approach that we're going to use is that we're going to estimate the bare correlator here from a computer simulation. And these we're gonna compute in the usual way using the Hadamard renormalization procedure. So first let's review the right part here, the Hadamard renormalization procedure. Good, so the first step of the Hadamard presormalization procedure is the Hadamard function, G here. We could also use the Feynman propagator. The important thing is you have some kind of two point function. Um, so for a Dirac field, this happens to be half the commutator. If we're a Bose, on behalf of the anti-commutator because the, the commutator would be zero in that case. The Hadamard function is useful because it solves the Dirac equation or the, whatever the equation of motion for the relevant theory is. This is the Dirac equation. This is the Hadamard function. And here's how we know it's solved it. It's a little unfortunate introducing this for the spinner field because there's an extra step that needs to be done. So we're going to later appeal to a theorem that applies to second order hyperbolic partial differential equations. But the Dirac field is a first order partial differential equation, so we need to do an extra little bit. So first we introduce this guy, curly G, called the auxiliary Hadamard function. And it's defined so that when we plug it in here, the Dirac operator is square, and we get a Klein-Gordon equation on the bottom here. We get a Klein-Gordon, oh shoot. We don't just get any Klein-Gordon equation, we get one with a specific coupling to the Ricci scalar, but there we go. All right, so now we say, let me get definition. We say a quantum state is said to be a Hadamard state if it takes a certain form. And in one plus one, that form is like so. So our Hadamard function is here and it's some smooth, it's called a bispinner, but some smooth two point function V times a logarithmic divergence in the geodesic distance between the two points plus some other smooth bispinner. Why do we care about that? Oh, and where mu here is some dimensional constant that you get to pick. S is a geodesic distance between X prime and X, and then V and W are smooth. And because V and W are smooth, all the divergences in this expression have to come from the logarithm. The only thing that blows up when X prime equals X is that S goes to zero. So the logarithm you know, is, is what you have to deal with. If you're, right, and it's not obvious, but this is a demand that we essentially recover in a certain sense that makes sense in AQ, algebraic Q of T. Um, the Minkowski vacuum correlator at short distances. The basic idea is that all the divergences, like in Minkowski space, depend only on the separation between X prime and X and not on just some random point in the space time. So you're not just walking around one day and you suddenly explode. Good, so now we have, we've, we've, we've assumed the Hadamard condition, and then we know from the theory that this Hadamard auxiliary propagator satisfies this partial differential equation, which we're then gonna solve well, we'll turn back to our you know, second year uh, differential equation textbooks and we'll look into recursive solutions of partial differential equations. And then we plug in a series in S 
and then we truncate at the point where we need to stop because the relevant thing that we want to renormalize doesn't care about s anymore at higher orders. In, in the case we're dealing with here, we need to go to, I think, uh, second order in s. And then you'll find that when you, when you write out these recursive equations, that V is determined entirely by M, the mass that you set in for the field in the first place, and by the metric. So V doesn't care about anything except the local geometry. But W does. W depends, in addition to those things, on an, some arbitrary function that you plug in in the first place. So where does the quantum state go? Well, it has to go into W, because it certainly didn't go into V, because V would be the same for any, any quantum state you picked. So by, already we know, just by looking at this, that the divergences of the free theory, at least, have to be independent of the particular choice of quantum state, given that that state be Hadamard. That last part's a little bit of a caveat, I suppose. That might be somewhat circular reasoning. It's not quite circular, but it's a bit of a restriction. But anyway, as long as we stick the Hadamard states, and you'll just have to believe me that you should, um, you'll find that the divergences are state independent. Okay, so now we're going to exploit this fact to renormalize the following Dirac bilinear terms. So there's two gamma matrices plus a gamma five. Well, actually, if you conclude the identity, I guess there's three. So there's gamma zero, gamma one, the identity, and gamma five. And we're gonna work out every coupling of psi bar psi to, to one of these operators, which we've named ci, c5, and then the current, j0 and j1. Um, when you do the point splitting regularization, you can express these in terms of the Hadamard function here, like so. So we're, re we're gonna be treating these formal expressions as limits, which are now defined, of this bare expression minus the divergent terms that occur in that expression. And again, remember, it's not just the divergent terms, actually. It's all the locally determined ones, some of which are finite. Um, and then you can go click on the archive link in the bottom right if you care about the tawdry details. But if you don't, then at least in conformal coordinates, you'll just realize that you get these expressions. So here are the divergences. And now the idea is that if you subtract these, if someone hands you this number, and you subtract this number, then you'll get something that uh, has a finite coincidence limit. And that means that you can define this thing. That gives us uh, a procedure. First, we're going to choose a state. Which state? Well, it doesn't really matter. Just whatever state you like. We're going to compute the, this object from that state numerically using any of a variety of simulation algorithms. And then we're just going to subtract this and take the limit. So this gives us a way of getting continuum data from the discrete theory, from discrete theories. Well, actually, I haven't proven it's discrete yet, but it gives us a way of getting continuum theory from the unrenormalized theory anyway. Ooh, that was a mouthful. So any more questions before I move on to the choice of state? Yeah. So uh, I have two questions. One, you said that you were taking the point splitting along a geodesic. Yeah. And also along a time slice. Yeah. Are those things always right. the same? So I did misspeak a little bit. So you write down in the first, in the covariate formalism, you first write down, you take the limit along the geodesic, and then it depends on a covariant measure of the geodesic distance. And then you project that limit onto your favorite curve, which doesn't have to be a geodesic anymore. So you just basically reparameterize the limit with a non-geodesic curve, basically. And in this way, you can pick any curve you want. Mm -hmm. Again, and my second question in the previous slide, if you can go to the but Did everyone hear the first question? The first question was, sorry. Yeah. The first question was, I said that, first I said that the limit had to be along a geodesic, and then I said that the limit was in, in some random hypersurface that I picked, which clearly won't necessarily be tangent to a geodesic. So how does that make any sense? Well, the reason that it makes sense is that I skipped over a bit, which is that first you take the limit along the unique geodesic between the points, which won't be confined to the hypersurface in general. And then you project that limit onto one that is confined to the hypersurface. So the coordinates change, the parameterization changes a little bit. Okay. Sorry, Jim. Uh, if you can go back to the previous slide. This one? Yes. So there are like most of the divergent terms do not seem to actually diverge. No? Like That's right. The last one does have a one over. So this term doesn't even get corrected. This, is a, this one is divergent. This one is not divergent. And this one is divergent. Sorry, the first one is divergent. Oh, good point. This is supposed to be a logarithm over that whole oh, thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there. I see. So that when, whenever there's no divergence whatsoever, that means that in the original theory, it's already. That means it was already defined in the original theory, usually because it's zero. There. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. So what's the definition of capital omega? The, the question is what is the definition of capital omega? Capital omega is the conformal factor in the metric. So I'm choosing. So it's g mu nu 
equals omega squared t x beta mu nu. And because I work in 2D, this is actually a general expression. Uh -huh. Yeah, but this wouldn't be general in the higher dimensions. Yeah. That's, why, that's why you can obtain the divergence terms analytically. No, I could still obtain them analytically. I just would have to express them in terms of a geodesic measure, the geodesic distance. And this is done in the paper. But I just went here, went ahead and specialized under the coordinates I care about. Yeah. OK. How are we feeling? How are our souls? Very good. OK. So now I'm going to talk about the state that we're planning to simulate, which is called the Hawking Hartle vacuum. Before I do that, let's retract a bit. Let's put our hats on. The year is 1970, and we've just got this cool thing called quantum field theory. And now we want to think, hey, what if I do this in curved space time? What goes wrong? Oh. Just started that whole story, but that's not really what my slide says, is it? I'll move on to the point two here. Well, the first thing we note is that in Minkowski quantum field theory, everything's kind of built around, I don't want to say that we always use the vacuum state, but it, there's, there's definitely kind of a central role played by a special state called the vacuum state. Um, so it's really a lot easier to do at least perturbative quantum field theory if you can single out some sort of background state to perturb around. But this becomes problematic in curve space time QFT which you can see by just kind of looking at the following. So here's the Hamiltonian we would get for some arbitrary choice of omega. And then for inertial of Minkowski observers, we set omega to one. And then we can select a vacuum by minimizing this appropriately normal ordered operator. We'll minimize that to get, get, to get to, so that's expectation value is zero. And this is sort of saying that the inertial observers in Minkowski space time don't measure an energy if they're just, you know, their Geiger counters don't click if they're just kind of standing still. This also makes the correlation function of the theory Poincaré covariant, which is usually a good thing. And um, it has the great feature also that since the Hamiltonian here is time independent, if we diagonalize it at some time, it will obviously also be diagonalized by the same state at future times because nothing has changed. That's actually implied by the Poincaré covariance, I think, but it's worth highlighting separately because this, these functions won't be in the generalization. Now, in a general space time, we can't find an omega that's time independent. And we say this in one plus one, we say the static, the space time is static if we can. In higher dimensions, it might be either static or stationary, but it's the same. Basic idea. Um, in non static space times, we can only minimize h at one time. We pick out some Hamiltonian at some time, and we can diagonalize it there, fine, but it won't be diagonalized at future times unless the evolution is adiabatic. You can roughly understand this as geometry or gravity, like injecting energy into the system. If there's, it's perhaps unsurprising that if you have a time dependent field in the background, that, that there's energy is going to change in, in the theory. There's essentially things coming from outside. We call this the cosmological Schwinger effect sometimes when we're feeling fancy. So that doesn't seem like a good way of getting the right state, but also maybe we can constrain it with some kind of symmetry, but of course there won't be anything like that available in a general curve background either. So there's no equivalent to the Poincare group. Well, I lie, there is a generalization. The generalization we're going to use is the Hadamard condition. So we're going to demand that our correlation functions uh, take this form. And again, I can't give you a super strong argument for this, but it's basically a smoothness condition. There, there are strong arguments available. I just don't have the time or knowledge to really present them right now. Um, well, if it fails, and I'm going to regret having chosen this word, but there will be, that means that there will be like firewall-like places at random points where you just kind of suddenly die. That means like because there are divergences at x that don't depend on the distance. They don't go away. They're just there. A typical example would be if there's like a horizon in your space time and you chose a state that needs infinite energy to prepare the horizon, then this would be a situation where you don't have a Hadamard state because the horizon has a divergence. Speaking of horizons, now we're going to talk about a special class of space time which have so called killing horizons. So if we have a static space time, at least, we can demand that um, if we choose a Hamiltonian in the coordinates that don't depend on time, then if we diagonalize that Hamiltonian, it will stay diagonalized because the, nothing has changed, once again. So that's good. That seems like a good starting point. But if we demand both this and the Hadamard condition, there are surprising consequences in the case of the of space time of the horizon. So here's an example in Minkowski space time. So let's think about two different coordinates. There's these of the inertial observers where the time coordinate points along the time translational group of the killing vector. We we'll call those inertial coordinates. And then there's these accelerated ones here where the time points along the, the boost symmetry. Here's a picture of Minkowski space time. Um, these are the inertial axes. And then here are the accelerated axes. These are constant times 
this, this is a spatial slice of the accelerated observers, and this is one of the accelerated observers, and you can tell they're accelerated because they're curved. Um, these curves can't access the whole diagram because they all kind of convert asymptote here, which is a light light curve, and you can't go faster than light. So you can't accelerate past here if you keep, you have to stop accelerating and get through that part. And so these guys are confined to a wedge, which we call the static wedge. Um, right, so the accelerated observers, they can't get to V equals one, so they're bounded to a wedge by the killing horizon. Whereas the inertial observers can permeate everything. Since the inertial observers permeate the whole space time, their ground state is both static, it doesn't depend on time because there's no time to depend upon, and it's Hadamard everywhere because they can diagonalize at any point equally well. But on the other hand, that of the static observers will be singular here because the Hamiltonian that we're using implements a light-like translation here and a space-like translation here, and we're not going to get a good quantum state by, 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 by working with that. A similar situation obtains in the Schwarzschild spacetime. Well, this diagram is now in the Kruskal coordinates, um, and we can see that the basic difference is that I changed the names of the regions and that there's singularities at the top and bottom of the diagram. We have a class of static observers on the right part here who are outside the black hole, and they are able to hover in such a way, they're basically floating above the planet or whatever, and to do that, they have to fire their engines, so they're accelerating. And the infinite acceleration surface is the event horizon, and so they can't get inside it without, unless they stop accelerating. On the other hand, we can make observers who can fill the whole thing. They're called the Cascal observers, and they're not confined, but in this case, their metric depends directly on time. So if we use, oops, if we use them to define a quantum state, that quantum state will depend on time as well. Finally, we get another similar situation in Sitter spacetime, which I've drawn embedded in a higher dimensional Minkowski spacetime here. In the coordinates of that higher dimensional Minkowski spacetime, we can cover the whole manifold, but the Hamiltonian is going to depend directly on time again, and so the ground state we define that way well as well. If you're a geodesic in De Sitter spacetime, in a certain sense, the universe is accelerating too fast for you, so you get stuck within a little piece of it, like this guy here did. He's stuck within this ground reflex region. Um, and this makes yet another horizon for you, which you're trapped within. So if you use your Hamiltonian, and you reduce it, and you, use, you find a ground state from it, and you define your quantum field theory that way, well, it's going to blow up in this part. But it will be time to pass. Okay, so this seems to put us in a little bit of a double bind. Here's another kind of rough diagram of an arbitrary killing horizon space time. Here's the horizon. And here's two surfaces of these global observers who are aligned with the diagram. And in general, their Hamiltonian depends directly on their time coordinate. So if we, diag if we minimize that Hamiltonian, our state will be Hadamard, but not static. On the other hand, we could pick out observers who are confined within the diagram, and their Hamiltonian won't depend on time, but because it rotates hyperbolically, it'll be stuck within the wedge. So if we use that to define a state, our state will be static, but not Hadamard. So here's a way we can fix this, which was identified, as you might imagine, by Hawking and Hartle, and sometimes Israel. The, what we do is we take the static Hamiltonian, and we notice, hey, there's no time dependence here. So usually in quantum mechanics, it's a good idea to wick rotate. So let's try that. So we take T, we replace it with some imaginary parameter. That doesn't change H because it doesn't depend on T. But it does change the metric a bit. It rotates us into this Euclidean metric in which the time coordinate is now rotating in a circular rather than a hyperbolic way. And it just so happens that this rotation takes us from one patch into the other one. So we can use this Euclidean metric formally like a bridge to get across from one part of the diagram to the other. And that's great because now we have a slice that's defined everywhere. But it turns out we need to, in order to avoid a singularity here, we need to make a certain special choice of the periodicity of this rotation. And this just so happens to give us a, a, a special temperature called the unwrap temperature. Let me repeat myself a little bit. So if we, we have this um, slice, we define our Euclidean metric, and then we path integrate along it. And this path integral prepares another stationary state of this Hamiltonian because this Hamiltonian was, of course, used to define it, and the Hamiltonian doesn't know that we use an imaginary coordinate, um, and that's, that's, which is Hadamard everywhere because the slice is defined everywhere. And this gives us a unique state, which is both Hadamard and static, which we call the Hawking-Hartle vacuum. It's unique in an interacting theory, in a non-interacting non theory, 
in an interacting theory, there might be more than one because there's like, you know, spontaneous least broken symmetry type argument. It just says we would make up. If we can find this Hawking Hartle vacuum, so say we prepare this whole thing as a slice, but I live here, so I don't know about this slice. So people often command me to trace out part of the modes of the state, and if I do that, I'll get a thermal state at this summer temperature. So from the perspective of this Hamiltonian, if I, I can reverse the argument, if I prepare a thermal state at the under temperature of this Hamiltonian, I ought to get something that doesn't diverge if I go to the horizon. And that gives us a way of validating our identification. First, we're going to prepare a thermal state of our, some static Hamiltonian at the under temperature that's selected by the choice of omega. Then we'll compute our Hadamard renormalized expectation values and we'll confirm they don't diverge towards the horizon. One more question period. Okay, very good. So now I'm gonna outline my lattice discretization, our lattice discretization, Ooh, I'm getting full of myself. So now we, need, now we have our QFT Hamiltonian and we know the calculation we wanna do. We're gonna prepare this Hawking Hartle vacuum and we're gonna Hadamard renormalize it using the analytically derived divergences. And now we need to transcribe this Hamiltonian to a problem that we know how to solve numerically. I mean, there's other ways to do this in lattices, but the approach that seems to me to be most mature is to transcribe onto a lattice theory. Having done that, well, what we'll find is that we get a local gap Hamiltonian. And this is really good news if you're in the tensor network community, because it means you can use matrix product states to get an efficient representation of the ground state. Then you can do real-time evolution and yeah, it'll blow up eventually, but it's still, you can get pretty short real-time evolutions that, that you can get useful answers out of. So this would give us a way to solve at least short real-time evolution problems. But the present results, we don't use tensor network methods. We use, we, these are produced with free fermion methods because we're studying a free theory, so why not? But of course the idea is to generalize to interactive theory. What we'll find then is that the QFT correlators uh, will emerge from the lattice by first, so we have some finite lattice, one, two, three, and three is smaller than infinity, so you know it's finite. And then first what we're going to do is send the number of sites with the lattice spacing constant to infinity, and that's the infinite size extrapolation. That's convergent. Um, yeah, yeah, that's convergent. And then we're gonna send the lattice spacing to zero by interspersing an infinite number of sites in between all the points that we put there, and that's divergent. But we'll do it in a special way we're gonna hold the number of sites constant as we send the lattice spacing to zero so that the physical distance shrinks when we do this. And this physical distance, it turns out, can be directly inserted into the Hadamard continuum divergences. And you'll find that you just subtract them directly and you'll get the right answer. I don't actually have a good reason for why this should be so. It turns out to be true here. So I'd be very happy to hear someone who had some insight into that matter. Um, very good. Okay, so on the left here, I have a picture of a continuum. This continuous object is a rectangle, but I'm sure you can imagine all sorts of continuous objects. And there's a coordinate X that parameterizes this, this, this continuum. And on the right, I have a picture of a lattice, which I've symbolized with these little blue circles. And the lattice sites are separated by some ugh, lattice spacing A, and they get a label zero, one, two, and they get a distance zero, A, two, A, et cetera. Uh-huh, oh, Oop. sorry guys, good. Okay, so in the continuum, in the theory we like, we have Dirac fields and there are two components spinners. So there's two components each site. And then it turns out for reasons I won't get into that just directly discretizing this theory causes bad things to happen. So you have to do something a little more fancy. The fancy thing we're gonna do is identify um, the theory here with two components each site with a different lattice theory here that has only a single component each site. And here's how this works. First, at each even numbered site, well, n, n equals zero, n equals two, that's even, we take the top component, psi zero, and we identify that with some operator on the lattice. And just so, on odd numbered sites, we take the bottom component and identify that with the relevant operator there. How do we do this identification? Well, first we write down the canonical commutation relations that we want our continuum field to satisfy. So here's what they happen to be. If you work out from the canonical momentum in the theory I just wrote down, 
And then we want to map them onto some operator, onto some lattice operators, which, for example, you could take to be like this. You get a fermionic algebra. And then you just compare these expressions to get a normalization, which happens to be this. So this is the mapping you want to do. And if you do all that with the Hamiltonian here, you'll get this lattice Hamiltonian at the bottom here. And this is the guy that you want to solve on your computer. And you'll fix different space times by choosing different values of omega. Notice that it's actually the same as what you could have gotten in flat space time if m equals zero. And that's actually kind of nice because it's, of course, a conformal field theory in that case. So you wouldn't expect it to depend on the conformal factor. Okay, so now the claim is going to be that if I take this Hamiltonian and then I do it and I prepare states of it at the unright temperature and I prepare a whole bunch of them with different lattice spacings and so forth, then when I take the continuum extrapolation, I'll recover the continuum Hawking Hartle vacuum. So let's see how we would do this with one of our uh, quadratic operators. Here's the, what I call the chiral condensate, for example. I'm, I'm not the only one calls it that. Uh, so here's the operator, here's its name, and here's its definition in terms of covariant point splitting. And here's the divergent term. We need to sacro, sac, uh, subtract with the missing logarithm. Uh, right, and then Using our definition of the staggered fermions, we get this expression for mapping bilinear terms into each other from the continuum to the lattice, which we can then use to map our uh, quadratic operators into each other. The expressions are a little complicated, so I'm not going to present what you actually get in the lattice here, but you, you can look them up in the paper if you actually need them for some reason. So now we have an extrapolation procedure. So first, I call you on the phone and I ask, what's your favorite mass in space time? And you tell me. And then I write that down in my book and I put that into my computer program. So now I've got an m and omega. And now I'm going to compute correlation functions at the unwritten temperature of the Hamiltonian that I get with those choices. And I can do that any way I like. I can use it during tensor networks, which I'd have to do in the interacting case. And that's nice because I can do short real-time evolutions with that. I can use free fermions, the free fermion formalism, which also lets me do real-time evolution if all I care about is the free theory. So that's cool. And then we perform these simulations at increasing lattice length. So one, two, and then I add on sites. And then let's say here, here's one operator, here's another, and I want this correlation function. Then I decrease the lattice spacing but I hold the number of sites fixed. So as I double this, as I decrease the lattice spacing by half here, well, I had one, two, three, four sites before, and now I want to do com compare that with one, two, three, four sites again. So now I've got one operator that's separated by R, and now I have one that's separated by R over two. And this gives me a coincidence limit at the same time as I do the continuum limit. And then I extrapolate and I subtract the Hadamard divergences. Here's a fun little picture. So once again, I got my lattice sites and I want to compute some operator at some tick separation. Let's say this is the one. And then as I shrink the lattice spacing, well, more and more sites get added. And the idea is to compare the correlators computed at a fixed number of sites that holds some of the lattice of X constant. Then I subtract the divergence that I compute with the Hadamard procedure. And then formally, I ought to also take the delta N to infinity limit, but this turns out not to really do much. And then I'll end up with some renormalized operator. Good, uh, that's it for the lattice. Now it's time to talk about plots. But before I do that, I'll ask pause for questions once more. Okay, very good. So on the next slides, I'll show each of these Dirac bilinears computed in the hawking hartle vacua of Minkowski, Rindler, Schwarzschild, and De Sitter space time. And I'll show both the infinite size and continuum limits in order to get the renormalized answers. And the idea is to validate the identifications by recovering expected results in the continuum. The expected results we'll get are that what we get from the Rindler space time, which is just a different coordinate on Minkowski space time, ought to agree with the Minkowski space time results. That's the, you can think of this as being what the Unruh effect means. So if I take, if I take the Rindler metric and I prepare a thermal state at the unwritten temperature, I ought to recover the exact same correlation function as I would have gotten by taking the Minkowski metric and diagonalizing for the dependent ground state. And then I'll find that even in other cases, aside from Rindler spacetime, that I'll get results that are smooth 
uh, well, of course, I can't cross the horizon because I'm in the static patch, but that approach uh, that, that, that are smooth on the, as I go to the left towards the horizon, but only at the unreal temperature. Okay, so let's start with Minkowski spacetime and inertial slicing. Here's a picture of Minkowski spacetime, and these are the coordinate axes we're focusing on here, focusing on here the inertial coordinate axes. So this X is being identified with this X in the diagram. So everything is flat as we move across X because the Minkowski Hamiltonian is independent of X. Uh, right, so this diagram now shows uh, and the, the, the purple and the color, different colors here show different separations. So for example, this line shows a correlator computed at some R and this line shows a correlator computed at some closer R and this line shows one at some even closer R, et cetera, et cetera. So the different colors are getting closer and closer. And at the same time as they're getting closer and closer, the lattice is getting finer and finer. So these are simultaneously getting closer to the continuum and closer to coincidence. On the little inset here, I'm showing the finite size extrapolation. So these are finite lattices. So each point of the same color is at constant separation, but is moving to a bigger lattice. And then we extrapolate, I think I used a quadratic fit here, but to, to get this number on the left here. And these red dots are now what I call the infinite size result. But the infinite size result here is still at fixed, uh, is still on the lattice. So now I'm gonna take this curve and I'm gonna plot it against the lattice, uh, against the spacing to get this one. So that's gonna give me a continuum extrapolation. And then when I send this to infinity, a zero, I get this little red X, which I've moved up to the plot here. So this is the final result here. That's the, what I estimate for the field three value. And then the black dotted line you can hardly see is what you get from an analytic calculation, the same operator, which is straightforward enough to do in this case. This is again, the ground state of the Hamiltonian in Minkowski space. I'll stop to ask for questions there because it's, it's perhaps of some importance that this plot be understood. Very well. Okay, so that's the condensate. We also did it for the other bilinears, but they all turn out to vanish a little boringly. These ones depend, these ones couple even to odd sites and they turn out to vanish even on the lattice. Um, this one doesn't vanish on the lattice, but it approaches. I'll just promise you that if I had used more precise numbers, we get closer to zero. So it's essentially approaching zero. Oh, by the way, this is a finite mass of 0.6 in that case. Otherwise the condensate would also vanish. Okay, so now I'm gonna compare this to data in the Rindler spacetime. So this is the same plot I just showed you, and it's showing data from the ground state of the inertial Hamiltonian. And these plots now come from, so this X here is this X. So as I go this way, I'm going closer to the horizon along, I mean, it doesn't have to be that specific slice, but one of the slices in this patch. Good, and you can see that, so the results we want are smooth across the horizon, and then two, we want the same numerical value as Minkowski. So uh, we got zero, zero, and zero, and zero, zero, and zero, so that's good. But notice that the approach to zero was much less trivial in this case. We certainly didn't get zero in the finite lattices. It only approached that as we got closer to the continuum. Um, but the more interesting part is, of course, where we don't get a zero answer. So let's zoom in on that plot at the condensate. This is again, just the data from the Rindler spacetime. And here we have this X coordinate moving along some particular hypersurface. And as we get closer and closer and closer to the horizon, we can plot the condensate at different values of X. And now I've shown for two different masses, uh, three different data obtained at three different temperatures. So the lines in the middle were obtained at the unknown temperature and they look pretty smooth to me. They also line up very well with the black dotted line, which is the analytic answer you get from doing the calculation of Minkowski spacetime. On the other hand, if I change the temperature by even just a little bit, here I did 0.91 unra instead of 1.1 unra, then I get stuff that does start to blow up. So if I get a little hotter than the NR temperature, I diverge up. And if I get a little colder than it, I diverge down in the continuum as well. Let me pull the same trick in the short space spacetime. So here's the diagram. And now we're again confining attention to this patch. There's not, we're not, we're not going to simulate the Crescal spacetime this time. So there's nothing to compare to in any way. 
we wouldn't expect in this case the two things to be the same. So now I'm preparing thermal states at the under temperature of Schwarzschild spacetime, which depending on how picky you are, is, the under temp is also the Hawking temperature or is just numerically equal to it by accident. Um, so here are the operators go to zero and we can see that again, the approach is not so trivial, but we do recover zero very well in the limit. And then on the left here, we get data approaching the black hole. And as it passes through the non-trivially curved part, it curves up a bit. So it's distorted by gravity, but it again smooths out once it gets closer to the horizon in a way that depends on the mass. In fact, actually the relative mass between the black hole and, 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 the, and the field. And finally, we can do the same thing in De Sitter spacetime. And now, once again, everything goes to zero. We're in the static patch here. And in De Sitter spacetime, you can imagine there's a, there's, there's this, these actually connect to each other on both sides of the, on both sides of the cylinder I've drawn here. And because of this, there's two horizons, and we find that the results are symmetric, and uh, they're not enforced to be symmetric. These are actually like that. And they're smooth, but only at the bunch Davies temperature. Okay. And that's about that. So I'll give you my concluding summary. So in order to prepare our initial conditions for semi-classical gravity simulations, we formulated quadratic expectation values in curves one plus one G spacetime as the continuum limit of a sequence of lattice theories. And we define the expectation values using Hadamard normalization, and we computed them on the lattice. Then we validated those identifications by numerically recovering expected continuum values in the hawking hartle vacuum of Minkowski, Schwarzschild, and De Sitter spacetime. And I'll thank you very much for your attention. And uh, thank you. That's it for me. Thanks, Adam. Um, are there any final questions? Do you have a question? Uh, so, uh, can you try the uh, Schwarzschild de Sitter space to get the Schwarzschild de Sitter space? Yes, where there's, uh, I think, two temperatures, not a uniform temperature, I guess. So, I think it sounds interesting to try the space. Yeah, so the role of the Hawking Harlow vacuum here was merely to validate the simulations. We could have prepared any other state you like. So if you can give me a Hamiltonian definition of your state, then I can give you, I claim, <laughs> like a simulation of it. So if you can, yeah, so if you can define this state in terms of a Hamiltonian, then yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Can I make a question? Yeah. So uh, from your numerics, it's not clear to me where is the divergent part? Um, where is the divergent part? Yes, so you said that you made the limit um, so the lattice spacing going to zero, but then you would also subtract these uh, Adamard divergence. Yeah, so the divergence, I didn't, I mean, I showed the renormalized quantities here, but the divergent, oh, this is also subtracted. I haven't, I, you're right, I haven't actually plotted the divergences. Um, okay. So the divergence comes in after the, oh, let me get to a blank spot so I can draw. Okay, so if I had a, so on the lattice here, And then again in the continuum, so I have some x and some x prime. And then I have some, oper some correlation function that depends on those two things. And I'm identifying that with points on the lattice that are separated such that uh, this point here is different from this point by x prime. Mm -hmm. And then what I would do in the continuum is now bring x prime closer to x. And if I do that, and I plot this here, here, and here, I'll get a divergence. Mm -hmm. So x prime minus x, and then c. And let's, let's say it, the divergence might look like that. Yeah. And then, so the, what I'm doing here is plotting, now I'm taking, a, let's say I divide this by two. Oops. And then maybe they get a little closer. Like always with uh, the same number of sites between every time. Mm -hmm. And then I'm plotting C on the lattice here, here. And then once again, I'll get, it turns out roughly, not the same expression, but something that approaches the same expression as you get closer to that divergence. And then you subtract the Hadamard divergence. And then you also subtract the same Hadamard divergence here. And then you get the finite answers that I predict, that I, that I showed. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.
Okay. All right, so if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Adam again. <laughs>